The Aurelia Museum of Art and History is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We respect and observe the long and enduring presence of Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit on this land. Their teachings and stewardship, culture, and way of life have shaped our city's unique identity. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Margaret. She has a, a long time interest in textiles, learning to sew in her teens, studying hand weaving in her 20s, and subsequently making and selling hand woven items for several years. About 10 years ago, Margaret rediscovered sewing and joined a quilt sewing circle. She regularly sews and creates quilts for family and friends and participates in the creation of quilts for gifting to various organizations um, through the Aurelia Quilters Guild. Her interest in the history of the quilts and textiles has grown from there. As so, had, so has her collection of quilts, fabric, and books on quilting in the textile history. Margaret has joined us to share her love of the craft that has spanned generations for many families. She will present to us some of her cherished quilt collection and speak to us on the history of quilting and the stories behind the quilts she brought. Tonight I want to talk a little bit about the history of quilts. This is going to be quick. We could, we could be here for days. Uh, Literally, I'm not going to talk about all my quilts, but many of them have tags on them. You can go and look at them if you have any questions. Happy to answer them afterwards. I'm going to talk a little bit about quilts. What is a quilt? Where do they come from? How are they used? How were they used? What's the history? A little bit of Canadian quilting history and some quilt stories. Um, quilted textiles have been found in many parts of the world for thousands of years. Uh, there's an example of a quilted uh, silk fabric from the Far East that dates to several thousand years BC. The Romans brought quilted mattresses, which they called kulkita or kulkitra, and that is actually the origin of the word quilt in English uh, and also in other languages as well. But uh, as the Romans moved north in, in uh, Europe, they brought these uh, quilted mattresses with them, and that word became the word for anything to do with bed coverings, mattresses, covers, and so on. There are, uh, from the Middle Ages, there are pieces of quilted linen that date back to the uh, 14th century. And the quilt and quilted fabric and quilted clothing was actually brought back from the Crusades by the Crusaders because the, their enemies had quilted uh, clothing that they wore under their armor, which made it much more comfortable. So they thought that was a pretty good idea. This is a, a detail of an early European quilt. The origin is Sicily, dates from around 1395, and it's in the, in the collection of the Victorian Albert Museum in London, England. It depicts the legend of Tristan, and you can see the very detailed level of quilting. It's not patchwork, but it is quilted, and it, it puts those figures and, and uh, letters in relief. So what are quilts? We've got several kinds of quilts. We have whole cloth quilts. This is one that was made in France. My sister gave it to me about 15 years ago. And whole cloth simply means that it's all one piece of cloth. It's not patchwork and it's not applique. It's one piece of cloth that is quilted. This is machine made and machine quilted. But in the early days, particularly in France, they were made and beautifully made by hand. On the right, you see an example of trapunto that uh, or, uh, originated in Italy, and it is a form of stuffed quilting so that the quilter made all these very fine stitches to outline the patterns and then stuffed from behind to give it a great deal of relief. <laughs> <laughs> 
applique quilts are very popular and have been around for hundreds of years. This is one that actually belongs to my daughter. You can see the, the detail of it. And beautifully quilted, not very clean, but um, beautifully quilted and actually the quilting echoes the pattern of the flowers. Um, you can see it here. Now, uh, over there is a, is a broderie purse, which is uh, uh, really Persian embroidery. That was a very, those, those <coughs> quilts date from the 17th century and, and on. And they were either made, the, these ones were em embroidered, and the, uh, you can see the detail here on the right. Uh, these were pieces of chintz fabric, which would have come from India. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that fabric in a bit. But uh, when chintz became hard to get in uh, big pieces, uh, people hoarded what they had, and they cut out bits, so a, a bird or a flower or a butterfly, and applied that on top of, um, uh, of a plain piece of fabric. Patchwork. The quilt on the left <coughs> is, um, uh, it's an early quilt from, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it's in the collection of the UK Quilters Guild, and it dates from the early 1700s. There's an initial, the initials on it, uh, E.H., uh, uh, and a date, but nobody knows who E.H. was. So like many quilts, like the majority of quilts, they're anonymous, beautifully made, beautifully uh, handled, but anonymous. Uh, I know very little about the makers of those quilts, very few that I know who actually made them. On the right is a very contemporary piece of patchwork. The difference between applique and patchwork, applique means that you apply one piece of cloth on another in a pattern. Patchwork means you sew them side by side. This is a very contemporary one made in 2014. Embroidered quilts on the left is um, a red work quilt, and that was a very popular kind of quilt made in the 19th century and uh, appeared between 1855 and 1925. Red, interestingly enough, was a color that was able to be made fast. In other words, it didn't run. So uh, both red cloth and red thread was fast, so people enjoyed using it because you could wash it and the, the color would stay fast. So here's an example of some red work quilts. You can see here, these date, they're actually from the Pomeroy family house, and they date from around the turn of the 19th century. The turn of the 20th century. And on the right are, um, and another example of embroidery, those are crazy quilts. And you can see examples of crazy quilts down there. And they're, they're um, a combination of applique and embroidery. And you can take a look at those later because they're really lots of fun. So who made all these quilts? Oh, I want to talk about painted quilts first. I want to show you an embroidered quilt. This is something. A woman in Aurelia made this. A friend of mine called me and she said, do you want a quilt top? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe. And so she, she brought this over. This is made from a Mary Maxim kit and it's hand embroidery. She worked at HRC and wanted something to do on the long evening shifts. So she did this and it's really quite extraordinary. It's a queen size quilt made out of these huge blocks and the lovely pinks and greens. And so now I'm the proud owner of it. It's not quilted, it's just a top. And then I wanted to talk about painted quilts. A friend of mine brought me this. And from across the room I said, oh, it's a, it's a cross stitch quilt. And then I went over and looked at it and it's actually painted. Wow. It's painted, the little lines are painted. So I love to show those two quilts together. It's quite interesting mm -hmm. that they're so similar but differently made. And now there are so many different kinds of uh, fabric dyes you can make quite extraordinary. You can see these are quite extraordinary colors and beautifully quilted. So who made all these quilts? Those who had the leisure to spend the time and money on fancy needlework. Those who had means to buy fabrics and patterns those who needed to provide warmth and comfort for their families, 
Well, all of the above. <coughs> some were made to be used in the household, some made for more decorative purposes. The thing about quilting, you'll see in some of these quilts, how worn they get, because they are used. They're used and loved. They're put on beds. They're washed and aired and used. And people, you know, kick their toenails through them and that sort of thing. But that's the thing about quilts. Besides being anonymous, they're beautifully used. And they're soft and warm. So sewing and technology, there's so many pieces of technology that have helped sewing over the years. Um, flying shuttle in England, 1733, the spinning jenny, 1764, the power loom, chemical bleaching, the cotton gin, the jacquard loom, <coughs> all kinds of cotton printing technology. But what was really making a difference for the a uh, home sewer was the advent of the sewing machine. The one on the left is, dates from 1851, a Singer machine, turned by a crank, and then a later one that has a treadle, and that allowed the, that freed up the seamstress's hands uh, so that the, the fabric could be guided through the machine. So that was a big, big deal. The other thing about the Singer machines is, Mr. Singer was, he was no dummy. He uh, implemented an installment plan, so uh, $5 down and $3 a month for 16 months, you had a sewing machine, and sales exploded. I want to talk just very briefly <coughs> about the history of cotton. Cotton is what we use mostly in quilts today and over the years. India was an early um, adapter of cotton. They grew cotton and they had a climate that allowed them to work outdoors, and they had a climate that allowed them to grow certain kinds of plants that could be used as dyes and as mordants, and mordants are what is used to fix a dye. And they had been very, very successful as early as the 14th and 15th centuries in making these gorgeous, gorgeous patterns. This is a contemporary photograph, but it's a block print on a wooden block, and that's been used for centuries. They also painted on fabric and used resist dyes. Well, <coughs> in the 14th and 15th centuries, when trade routes were being opened up, they were really opened up from Europe for spices. But when the European boats got to the Spice Islands, they saw these kinds of amazing cloth from India, and they thought, well, they'd better take some home, which they did. And of course, people were just wild about them. They were light, colorful, color fast, beautiful fabrics. And they were so popular that in the <coughs> early part of the 17th century, uh, England and other European countries banned the importation of cotton. And um, <coughs> so they banned the importation of cotton from India. Uh, so that be, to protect their own textile industries. But it kept sneaking in there anyways. But this is what I was saying earlier about chintz fabric. Chintz is a Hindi word for spotted cloth. And when chintz became scarce in Europe, that's when they began to cut it up and applique it onto other pieces of fabric. We can't talk about cotton without talking about the slave trade which occurred during the 16th to 19th centuries in different parts of the world. And much of it had to do with cotton. Um, and this leads to an amazing story which has begun to emerge within the last 30 or 40 years about the quilt codes of the Underground Railroad. Have any of you heard of this? Yeah. So you know that there is some controversy uh, attached to it about whether or not it's true. Uh, but. Um, the oral tradition holds it up, and, uh, but there isn't much in the way of a written tradition about it, because it was an oral tradition. And, uh, but when, the, you know, during <coughs> the 19th century, over 100,000 slaves uh, escaped to freedom, uh, mostly to Canada, many to Canada. They were helped by a number of individuals, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, are two examples of black Americans who devoted themselves to assisting slaves. Quaker communities provided assistance, other church groups, and individuals. But to assist in the planning and execution of these really rather dangerous escapes, um, the oral history includes the use of quilt codes, which informed and guided the escapees. Pictured here are some of the blocks that were said to be used in these quilt codes. I have examples of some of them. This quilt 
is called the monkey wrench. It's also known as churn dash and hole in the barn door. But monkey wrench, uh, w when you saw a quilt, a monkey wrench quilt hung out, that meant that you should begin to gather your tools, begin to gather your supplies and get ready to move on. And uh, it also uh, was associated with the blacksmith on the plantation. And the blacksmith was somebody who not only worked on the plantation, but worked around the plantation. And so knew the lay of the land and was considered to be a pretty w smart fellow. So that's one of them. I don't have an example of the next one, that's Crossroads. Crossroads refers to uh, Cleveland and Detroit, which were crossroads where one could embark to freedom. The log cabin, there is a log cabin quilt over there, the yellow and green one, uh, that indicated safe housing. Uh, bow ties, which is the far one there, uh, was, it, it was a warning that you should dress up. If you were found in your slave clothes, you could easily be identified as an escaped slave. So at some point, it was wise to put on some different clothing. And so that was the sign when you saw that. That was what you meant to do. I have a quilt down here, which is a bow tie quilt. It doesn't look like that. I always knew that block is broken dishes. <laughs> but anyways, that's a bow tie quilt as well. So this is Drunkard's Path which you can see on the second row. And that's a, that warned people that there were um, uh, slave catchers about and uh, that you should, you should meander a bit. Don't take a straight path, you should meander a bit. Go forward, go backwards, take the drunkard's path and uh, that way you escape. A star, there are so many star quilts and star blocks, but the star was follow the northern star. And the tumbling blocks, which is the far one, I don't have an example of that, but that again was one that said, get ready, get ready, it's starting to move, starting to, to, to go. So it's a very interesting, as I said, somewhat controversial subject. But um, a dear friend, Andy Charters, has loaned me this book, Hidden in Plain View, by uh, uh, Jacqueline Tobin and Raymond Dobird, both quilt historians. Uh, Raymond Dobert is, was a professor of art history at Howard University, and Jacqueline Tobin is a quilt historian, uh, both American. And uh, this is a fascinating book um, that talks about the quilt codes of the Underground Railroad, so recommend it. So that's just a little aside. So let's talk about Canada's quilts. Um, we have a long history of quilting in Canada. Uh, warm bedding was of the utmost importance because of our climate. Guidebooks for settlers warned of the necessity to bring uh, bedding as it was very difficult to procure because you could imagine, I mean, when this area opened up in the 1830s, uh, we didn't have the general store yet. We didn't have trade established very much. So if you didn't bring it with you, then you probably didn't have it. And um, in Canada, uh, folks were able to grow flax to make linen and to, to have sheep to make wool. But it took time to establish that. So uh, it, things were pretty, uh, cotton and, and so on, were, were pretty hard to come by. As the uh, cotton mills began to uh, proliferate in the States around the 1850s, cotton became much more generally available and uh, people could go to the store and buy lengths of, of cotton. But then the, the, the frugal people who made the quilts gathered their scraps and, and put them together in the most interesting and amazing ways. Uh, cotton from England and the US became more available uh, by the mid 19th century. And quilting became a very popular and very necessary pastime as sewing machines became more common in the home and production increased. And quilts were often made by women mostly and they had lots of other things that they had to do. They had childcare, they had farm chores, they had household chores to do. Uh, so quilting was done uh, in spare time of which there wasn't much and maybe by the light of an oil lamp or candle. So it's amazing the quilts that were produced under these circumstances, beautiful, beautiful quilts uh, with very primitive tools. I mean, I mean, the tools that we have available now are, are uh, extraordinary. But when you think of them making them uh, without um, all of the, the special tools that we have now, they just, 
amazing things. This shows the book cover of Mary Conroy's book, Canada's Quilts, published in 1976. It's a wonderful book about Can Canada's quilts, although some reviewers will say that her Canadian history is a little sketchy, but um, it's, nonetheless, there's a lot of very good information about the quilts, the quilts of Canada. This is a book by Ruth McKendry, a wonderful book, uh, published in 1979, again with a very extensive view of the history of quilting in Canada and indeed other, other uh, bed covers as well, woolen and woven ones as well. Immigrants from the British Isles and Europe had really well-developed quilting skills when they came to Canada. This was not, not anything new for them. Uh, they had well-developed skills that they had grown up with before they emigrated. And quilting traditions came north uh, from the United States uh, with the United Empire Loyalists, who were of British, German, and Dutch heritage. A large Mennonite settlement was, uh, came to be in Waterloo County, begun in about 1800, and brought with them the quilting traditions of the Amish of Pennsylvania. And these traditions are still very much in evidence today. The Mennonite quilts and the quilt sales are very famous even to this day. And they, they can be, Amish quilts in particular have a, a, a particular style. They tend to use solid colors, not a lot of prints. They tend to use big blocks of color. They're very, very distinctive and, and beautiful quilts. We have the very, very earliest quilts uh, in Canada were found in New France. Now, they don't, they haven't survived, but in household accounts from New France, uh, they are mentioned. So we know that they had quilts there, likely mostly linen. Um, and there are two early quilts that we know of, linen quilts, one in Newfoundland and one in New Brunswick. And one of the earliest quilts known is in the Provincial Museum in St. John, New Brunswick, made in 1769 by a Mary Morton from flax grown, spun, woven, and bleached on the Morton family farm in the St. John River Valley. Uh, Mary Conroy's book has a picture of it, but it's such a grainy photograph that I, I, didn't, I wasn't able to make a good... Um, uh, reproduction of it. This next one is kind of fun. This is called the Confederation Quilt, Confederation Quilt, made by a dressmaker by the name of Fanny Parley. She made it in 1864 in New Brunswick. She was a dressmaker and she actually made ball gowns for many of the women who were attending the gala uh, events surrounding the Charlottetown Conference of 1864, just before Confederation. So she saved scraps from all these gorgeous dresses and made this crazy quilt. And you can see there are, there are large blocks and then it's surrounded by smaller blocks and then um, bordered with a, a, a gray silk ruffle. So this is, um, it now is in the county Hampton, uh, Hampton County Museum in New Brunswick. The quilting bee, this is actually from, uh, this, this is a picture of a jigsaw puzzle that's available through the Mary Maxim Company. I don't know how many of you know Mary Maxim, Mary Maxim Company. They sell all manner of things related to needlework and knitting and quilting and all kinds of things. The quilting bee was um, <coughs> a very important social gathering. Girls were tasked with completing up to a dozen quilts before they were to be married. In Ruth McKendry's book, she talks about, this is a wonderful story, about a family of uh, 12 girls, only one of them married. And when the family home was cleared out, you know, many, many years later, she found uh, over 156 unquilted quilt tops <laughs> that had been made by all these spinsters and never quilted. Because often, even though they made a dozen quilts, they weren't quilted until there was an actual ring on the finger. So, uh, but once that happened, then they jumped into action and got busy at the quilting bee. The friends and neighbors came. Uh, there was usually a bridal quilt made, which might be um, uh, a, a special quilt, often appliqued, often with roses. And that was uh, uh, usually quilted by the bride and her immediate family. So the quilting bee was um, often planned for the afternoon. And of course, if they could go outside, that was always a bonus. 
and uh, men were invited to join the women for a meal after the quilting bee, and that was a great opportunity for some music and dancing and socializing. Also from Ruth McKendry's book, A Little Bit of Quilting Folklore, a broken thread, a crop gone bad, a twisted stitch, a baby dead. And when you're at the quilt uh, bee and you finished quilting, somebody will put a cat on the top of the quilt and you shake it. And the, the girl towards whom the cat runs is the next one to be married. <laughs> <laughs> and there are cultural symbols that are stitched into these quilts as well, again, from Ruth McKendry. A weeping willow is a memory of a lost love. So if you see quilting stitches that, that remind you of a weeping willow. The letters H and L stand for Holy Lord, and it's a, a safeguard and a blessing that is stitched into the quilt. Shooting star, a memory of a lost child. Roses, passion, love, and fertility, most often found on the bridal quilt. We have a really strong tradition <coughs> of quilt and quilt making in Simcoe County. Ada Torrance was an artist from Orillia. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with her name. She was a, a painter, uh, but she also had a, an enormous interest in textiles, and she was a quilt designer. We have, I think Lindsay can corroborate this, we have some of her quilt designs in the collection at Orillia Museum of Art and History. And um, uh, this particular quilt, um, was one that was sewn and quilted by the uh, Women's Institute of Colson, and it went on to win uh, the Toronto Star Weekly Canadian Quilt Making Contest of 1956. So you can see the whole quilt is obviously sugaring off time, and then you can see some detail as well. Beautiful stitching, quite a modern looking quilt really. But again, applique, you can see the, the applique of the woman's form and her dress and so on. Quite a lovely thing. This one is interesting. It's another Ada Torrance quilt. This uh, photograph comes from the Public Library Archives. And uh, it's called uh, Northern Lights Quilt. And I'm sorry it's not in color. I couldn't find a picture. It's in, the, it's in the collection of the Royal Ontario Museum, but I couldn't find it in, I couldn't find a photograph of it in their collection online. But um, Torrance felt that the quilt design offered an opportunity for drama, for something depicting Canada coast to coast. And she chose to portray the Aurora Borealis, the Loon, the Big Dipper, and the North Star. The colors were quite modern, jade green, chartreuse, lime green, yellow, and black. And materials were difficult to source in those colors in the mid-50s, but she found them aided by her friend, Olga Maudsley. And Olga Maudsley happens to be my late husband's great aunt. Olga was sister of John's grandmother. And of course, I knew Olga much later. I wasn't on the scene in the 1950s. Well, I was, but not here. Um, in the 1950s, so I never met Olga until she was quite an elderly woman. I never knew she had this interest in quilting. So uh, again, it's one, of those, it's one of those lost stories that you wish, if only I'd thought to ask somebody, you know, but I didn't know. So that, again, was a prize winner, again, at the 1956 um, Star Weekly contest. And um, it's now, as I said, in ROM's uh, textile department as part of their uh, permanent collection. And all the one, it was all uh, pieced and quilted by the women of the Simcoe County Arts and Crafts Association. Now, um, many quilts are made to gift to people. I belong to the Early Quilters Guild, and, and we as a group uh, make and donate hundreds and hundreds of quilts. Um, they can go to seniors' homes. They might go to a hospital. There are groups of people who make them uh, and donate them to police organizations so that a police cruiser can have a quilt in the trunk, and then it's available to provide comfort uh, if, if needed. One of the biggest uh, outpourings of this type of quilting happened during the Second World War. Um, the Red Cross, uh, the Canadian Red Cross gathered uh, quilts made by Canadians, mostly women, some children, some men, 
and they were made in the thousands. During the war between 1939 and 1945, Canada sent just about half a million quilts to Great Britain and to Holland. And they were used and loved uh, there. People who'd been through the Blitz and lost everything, people who had, uh, had gone through troubled, troubled times, and so they received these quilts. You can see on the left one that was made in Moose Jaw. Very simple quilt, a, a simple nine patch quilt, but the thing about it is that kind of quilt can be made by a number of people. Everybody takes a block and makes a block, and uh, you, you make it with your own scraps or you borrow scraps from somebody else, and then it can be pieced together and quilted by the group. And this on the right, the gift of the Canadian Red Cross Society, is usually the only tag that went with these quilts. There are about 350 of these quilts that are known and documented in Great Britain. There's a woman who lives in the south of England who's made it her business to find these quilts. And now she's in discussions with the uh, Royal, Museum, Royal Alberta Museum uh, with the thought of bringing some of them back to Canada. But here's this, this, this one actually, it had more than just the Canadian Red Cross Society label. It had a, a label of some sort that identified it as being from Moose Jaw. And so it got returned to Moose Jaw and is now in the Western Development Museum in Moose Jaw. So that's a nice story. Here's another one. It was made in Steep Rock, Manitoba. It was sent to England to the Dudley Road Hospital in Birmingham and was eventually given to a Mrs. Betty Craddock. It stayed in the same family and was cherished by their son, Anthony, who is shown here with the quilt. Following her husband's death, after 70 years of marriage, Mrs. Craddock was clearing out and came across this quilt. She and her son decided it should be returned to Canada. Using some information that they found on a quilt label, they got in touch, they found that it was made in Steep Rock, Manitoba. They got in touch with the Manitoba Museum and it has since been returned and is part of that collection. It was returned in 2014. So those are amazing, I mean, those are two stories out of half a million stories. They're just extraordinary stories. And we'll never know who made them all. They, from people from all over the place. And, and uh, you, you'd go to your Red Cross meeting and you had to take a block and a penny, I mean, or a block and a nickel, and that was how you did that. And you put your block together with everybody else's and, and out came these quilts. Today, quilting is a multi-billion dollar industry around the world. There are many, many uh, well-known uh, quilt exhibitions in Japan, in Australia, Holland, France, Great Britain, all over the States and in Canada, of course. This is an example of a very modern Canadian quilt made by Sue Sherman from Newmarket, Ontario. She is a retired engineer, can you tell? <laughs> I mean, did you ever see such accurate piecing and accurate angles? And it depicts uh, the struggles of animals to live in the decreasing space that's left to them uh, from uh, man's activity. And so the extraordinary thing about this is it's painted. It's not pieced, it's painted. And she has done what you call thread art. Uh, she's painted the animals, but also decorated them with thread art, which means you're sewing on your sewing machine to bring out uh, features of the animal. Uh, so that, uh, uh, that took best in show at, uh, the, at Quilt Canada this year in 2023. So I think that's an extraordinary piece. But we, you know, there's not a, a, probably not a community in Canada or very rarely a community that doesn't have a quilt guild, sewing circles uh, that get together on a regular basis and make quilts. And we have innumerable quilting competitions and so on. Um, we have a wonderful quilt and rug fair at uh, Simcoe County Museum annually. That was started in 1949 by an artist called Thor Hansen. And he decided that we needed a place to display these beautiful quilts and rugs that people make. And so that's still going strong. They had 200 quilts in their first fair in 1949 and it's still going strong today, uh, every year. It's a wonderful, wonderful show. Um, another wonderful Canadian quilt, this is made by Kathy Wiley. She lives in Dwight, Ontario. And it's an, I had the chance to see this. She did a workshop at OMA at the museum a couple of years ago. Um, and I had a chance to take her workshop. My little piece looks nothing like that. I made a little maple leaf. 
but it's an absolutely extraordinary quilt. I just couldn't, I couldn't take my eyes off it. It was just amazing. It's applique, it's machine quilting, um, it's, it's extraordinary. And you can see the detail here. I mean, she doesn't just use a color of blue, she uses how many colors of blue and green and so on. It's just amazing. Anyways, that um, took almost a dozen prizes internationally in England, in the uh, United States, in Canada, all over the world. This quilt has traveled and been, and been um, awarded prizes. It's just a stunning piece of work. Just going to show you this last one. <clears throat> this is an interesting one. It's made by um, Andrea Tsang Jackson. She's from Halifax. She was the artist in residence at the um, uh, Canadian Museum of Immigration, Pier 21. And um, while she was there in 2018 as artist in residence, she had uh, this array of fabric with her. And she asked people, and over 1,200 people contributed to this quilt, to, to make, just make a little block. And then she took them and put them together. And she's delineated them in what she calls a forest of family, love, freedom, diversity, culture, reference, hopes, dreams, and so on. And uh, it's a 10 foot by 10 foot quilt. And it took first place in the group quilt category at the 2018 Quilt Con in Pasadena, California, a great big quilt conference. So that's uh, just an example of some of the very modern quilts that we have in Canada. But we have a rich, rich quilting history. And um, I'll just talk for a minute, if I may, about some of these quilts. Um, these quilts I, I, I love. These came out of the Pomeroy House on Mississauga Street. And this was after my mother-in-law had passed away. And I found these in a cedar chest in the attic. And even though my mother was a fine needleworker, and I know she did some quilting, I had never seen these quilts. I suspect just from the, the this, according to Barbara Brackman, who's a quilt historian from the United States, this is called the tulip pattern. And it, it's so interesting the way it's made. You take a white square, which is the background. Then you take a red square, slightly smaller. You fold the red square <laughs> into four pieces. And then you cut it, just like children cut snowflakes out of paper. And then you applique it onto the background. If you come and look at this, I defy you to find the stitches. They're, it's red thread, and these are hand-stitched. Needle turn applique, so the raw edge is turned under. and. Um, it, it's just, it, they're just beautifully done. And very, very nicely quilted. There's a pair of them. One of them got a red border. The other didn't. Don't know why. A anyways, they were likely made by the Anderson sisters. Duncan Anderson was a <coughs> mayor of Aurelia in the 1920s. And he built that house in 1906 and moved into town from the farm with his three daughters and his wife. And I know that they were fine needlewomen. And so it was likely Cassie, Eva, and Mamie Anderson, who maybe all or one of them made the quilts. I don't know for sure. But anyways, um, we talked about those. The other thing that is a really interesting phenomenon is the feed sack quilts. Um, in the 19, 1920s to 1960s, um, manufacturers who, who manufactured and sold um, grains, flour, sugar, and so on, did so in feed sacks. And uh, <coughs> they were, uh, they discovered that if they made the feed sacks out of pretty material, then people would buy their flour as opposed to somebody else's flour. And so, you know, a wife might send her husband into town to say, get me 100 pounds of flour, but this is what I want. I want this pattern. That, uh, this quilt top, it's just a quilt top, not, not finished, is made from feed sacks. And I, I was disbelieving, but I bought it from a, a woman who wrote, wrote a book on Canadian feed sacks, so I guess she knew what she was talking about. Until I found this feed sack, which is a gingham. Because I'd always thought of feed sacks as being colorful floral prints, but that one isn't. This quilt, I don't know for sure, but I think it's a feed sack quilt because it's so bright and so pretty. And this is called, um, um, oh, if I had a brain, I'd be dangerous. I can't remember the name of the pattern. Sandy, help. <laughs> Pardon me? I didn't hear. Sam. Sam. 
Yeah, oh, the stamp, yes, a postage, postal, postage stamp, yeah, yeah. Anyways. Um, some quilts are very utilitarian, these two, for example, are wool patches. And uh, they're narrow. And part of that is, and they're, they're lined very simply, and tied, not quilted, so quick to make. And they're narrow. And some people think that these are made for the, the hired man's bed, because all he got was a cot. <laughs> so, but they're warm and serviceable. This one is actually made out of men's suiting samples. And these, of course, are some crazy quilts, which I love. I think they're beautiful. But sadly, I don't know exactly who made them or exactly when they were made or where they were made, but they're lovely. Quilters nowadays are, are, are told, put labels on your quilts, just so that we now can understand where quilts are made and anything you want to put in about it, what, what year it was made, who made it, who quilted it, and so on. And this is one of my grandmother's quilts, so that's rather special to me. Just a simple Dresden plate. So that's all that I have. Oh, I have to tell you about this quilt. This one, and then I'll stop talking. Um, this quilt was made in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. My mother graduated from the University of Saskatchewan in 1938, and she, her first teaching job was in Prince Albert. So she went up there to teach, and she bought a ticket on a quilt raffle, and she won this quilt. It's made out of men's ties, and uh, it has this extraordinary magenta background, which, as my mother washed it, you can see, has come through on the quilting. But uh, anyway, so she was very pleased with it, and she told my she was engaged to my father at the time. My father was a very, uh, very newly minted United Church minister, and he was horrified that his fiance had bought a ticket in a raffle. <laughs> So this are, these are some of my collection, and uh, <coughs> as I say, I just pick them up where I see them, when I can afford them, and uh, I love them. Now, we have some special guests who are gonna come and talk about their own quilts. We have Beverly Baker. This quilt, was made by my mother, and I don't know if the, we want to keep the lady standing holding it. Uh, she gave it to me in 1976. It's her own design, and she made her own patterns. She made it particularly for me because I love oval shape. I have a lot of oval shapes in my house. I have oval mirrors, oval picture frames, an oval dining room table, and many other things. And then my favorite flower is the rose. So she's done the, the ring of roses. She quilted every stitch herself, did, every, did the applique and everything herself. Actually, she was uh, a great person to go out to quilting bees and quilt on other people's quilts, but when she was making a quilt for a gift or for a customer, she did every stitch herself. Nobody else got to, to not to quilt on her quilts. Anyway, my, my grandmothers and great-grandmother had all, as I say, lived in this part of the world, and they had quilted for the reasons that Margaret mentioned, to keep warm. They lived in the country. They made their quilts out of patchwork, out of old garments, out of the, the tied quilts they made out of men's trousers or women's skirts or whatever material they could put their hands on. Now, by the time my mother was making this quilt for me, we had moved to a little more comfortable situation. We did, I was a bread depression baby and we lived through the war and we had many privations and troubles, but by this time we had electricity and we had 
uh, central heating, and my mother didn't have to make quilts. She did it as her art, her hobby, what she wanted to do. And she used to say she couldn't bear to go out and buy perfectly good material and cut it up into little <laughs> squares and sew it together again. She wanted to paint pictures and uh, express her, her feelings with her quilts. She made one for a gentleman who collected antique cars, or maybe vintage cars. I know there's, there are differences, but she sought out pictures of the different cars of different ages and appliqued and embroidered cars on that quilt. Another quilt she made with all different kinds of spring flowers, only the spring flowers, you know, daffodils and tulips and trilliums and so on. So she was, she had her very definite ideas about her, what her design should be. It's beautiful, just lovely. The one other little bit of finishing up here, we all are familiar with Aurelia's famous museum, Gordon Lightfoot. My, he went to, my brother went to school with Gordon and sang in a quartet with him for a time. Every time I hear that beautiful song, Pussy Willow's Cattails, I think my mother would have made a quilt with Pussy Willow's <laughs> and Cattails. She's already done the roses. We also have Diane Francos, who has a quilt here. Do you want to talk us, uh, talk us through that quilt, Diane? Um, I actually bought it in Seattle, and it's a patchwork quilt. I was told that it was probably done in the Depression. And I, I, what I liked about it was all of the colorful fabrics, because I think sometimes we think of, um, well, you know, before black and white, all the pictures were in black and white, so we don't think of the colors that people wore. I think that's what I was thinking about. As a child, um, I did start to make a quilt, <laughs> uh, a, a nine square. I don't know where it is. I never did finish it. Um, but I did buy a Singer sewing machine. <laughs> I was 12 years old. Good for you. <laughs> I couldn't, it was $60, and it was $5 a month for a year. I thought I could earn that much money babysitting. But of course, Singer wouldn't allow me to put my name on it, so I had to get my mother to sign for me. <laughs> and uh, my mother had had a treadle mm -hmm. sewing machine, mm -hmm. and this was an electric sewing machine. And One uh, step up from mom. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, did, I used to do a lot of sewing, but I don't now. So I don't know if you can tell us a, a few things about Well, this I was going to say that the, the quilt, it was interesting because the Victorian times, the times when the crazy quilts were made, the colors were deeply saturated, darker colors. But as we came into the, the 20th century and certainly into the Depression years, the colors got lighter and brighter. And uh, I have a wonderful book called... Um, Oh, golly, one moment, please. Um, oh, Bright Colors in Dark Times. And it's all about the quilts of the Depression. And, uh, and it's amazing how, how bright the colors were and, and soft pastels and so on that were more comforting than the, the dark, more gloomy ones. So I would say there's probably a lot of Depression-era fa uh, fabrics in here. But also, uh, you know, the interesting thing about quilts is people collect fabric to make a quilt. And, I have, um, in quilts I've made, I have d dress fabric that I might have bought in the 1960s or 70s, and I think, oh, well, I'll just use a little <laughs> bit of that, you know. So the fa it, it's hard to date a quilt just by fabric because yeah. people save their fabrics and use them. So anyway, so thank you, Diane, very much for bringing that in. We have one more quilt story. Um, Teresa Fama, if you would like to come and tell us your story. My quilt was a story quilt. I had. I started quilting, my mom was a quilter, and that's when I started later in life. When I retired, actually, is when I really got into quilting. And then I heard about a story quilt. Is that a story quilt? I've never seen or heard of a story quilt. This lady had made one, so I contacted her and asked her more questions. And I said, you know, I'd love to make a story quilt of my childhood home. I grew up in, in, in an area, Thunder Bay Beach, near Penetanguishene, and it's an area like no other. I lived across the road from an amazing park, a beach, a wooded area behind us where we played, and it was my playground. 
and I wanted that memory to be preserved in time. So I decided to make the story quilt. Instead of making patchwork or appliques, I actually painted the pictures on each block. So the entire center of the quilt is a block of pictures of my favorite memories. Just to give you a little example, one of my memories, there was a, a baseball diamond across the road from our house as well. And we, we raised pigs and chickens. Three little piglets dug a hole under the fence one day during a baseball tournament and ran across the road into the field. All the, the ball players threw down their bats and their gloves and started chasing these three little piglets all around the baseball field. And they caught them and they brought them back to our house. And they said to my parents, best ball game we've ever had. <laughs> so when I painted that block, of course, I had put the baseball field with a picture of me pitching the ball to one of my little sisters and little piglets around me, <laughs> right? So each, each block actually tells the story. And, and they're painted. Around the, the center block, it is not painted. It's actually fabric that I purchased with a beach, like sand, water, and the sky. Um, one of my cousins, I'm Métis, one of my cousins was putting on an event last um, two summers ago about the Métis down in the area where I grew up. So I said, hey, I'm Métis, can I come and show my quilt? And he said, well, absolutely. So I brought my quilt, set it up, about 200 people came, and they all stood around the table in groups and said, well, tell us the story of this block, tell us the story. And this kept going, right? And they were all interested and wanted to know more. And people started saying, you should write a book. And guess what? I did. <laughs> The quilt changed my life, right? So I, I, it took me nine months to make the quilt, to, which is how long it takes to have a baby. <laughs> so my baby. And it took me 18 months to write the book. So I published the book actually this past summer, and it's about my childhood home and growing up in Thunder Bay Beach, right? And it started because of the quilt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for such a terrifically complete rendition of your story. I know you could have gone into sub-stories for every quilt. Well, your mother's quilts, for one thing. Well, you know, don't even get me going because we could be here all night. But this is from us at OMA to you, Margaret. So oh, thank, thank you, you very much. much. We thank really appreciate much. it. knock anything down <laughs> okay so thank you everyone this has been a very special evening being gathered in person with beautiful quilts to admire and fascinating stories to hear it was great to see everyone in person after such a long hiatus and thank you very much for coming out it's lovely to see a full crowd here this is wonderful uh, this is our last talk uh, for our speaker series for 2023 um, as is our committee's yearly tradition we have invited local historian Dave Town to kick off next year's OMA history speaker series on Wednesday January 17th 2024 um, via Zoom. Um, Dave's book, The Aurelia Spirit is Born, is his 22nd book. Um, released this past summer, it will be the subject of his talk. Dave has invited everyone along on this exploration of determination, vision, and audacity Aurelia was once famous for, starting back with the early settlers who labored to clear land and build a better life for their children. The OMA History Speaker Series has its 2024 calendar lined up, and we're actually starting to book 2025, if you can believe it. Um, we have responded to survey quests, requests about the topics you would like to see covered, and a peek into a couple of the topics we'll present next year. Aurelia Matters Community Editor Dave Dawson will present The Packet in Times, Its History, and the Move to Digital Media. John Smith of the Aurelia Heritage Center will speak on the history of the Tidal Carriage, Carriage Factory. Um, thank you for your ongoing support. If you wish to support OMA programming, there are donation boxes by the refreshment uh, table. They help support OMA's programming for children. Um, if you would be interested in joining the History Committee, um, please reach out to me or any of the members who are here tonight. We would love you to join us. We're just a bunch of fun local history enthusiasts and we'd love you to join us. And we wish you a very happy and wonderful holiday season. We just 
um, finished Thanksgiving, so on to Christmas now. So we look forward to seeing you in 2024 um, at Dave's talk. And once again, thank you so much for coming out. And thank you, Margaret. It's been a wonderful evening. Thank you. I now have a scenario that I wasn't actually overly fond of, yet it was a, a possible scenario. Well, what do you do next? I Googled sites about slave relations, Virginia history, black history in the US, Canadian black history, the blacks in Toronto in the early 1800s. Any site having a chat section uh, board for posting questions and inquiries or anything that I could enter in my scenario in a quest for answers. And I did just that. I left no stone unturned. We were just discussing that over 4 million Canadians are descendants of the British home children, yet uh, most of our population don't know about these, about the children and what they endured and why they came to Canada. So it's really important that we share this story and that we make Canadians aware uh, of the children and the impact that they had on our society and in the building of our nation. By the mid to the late 1990s, some 30 years later, the curriculum had evolved to meet the needs of a much more complicated department now engaged in responding to an increasingly complex assortment of events and incidents. The curriculum had also advantage to meet the needs of the corporate side of the fire department. Because remember, running a large or even a medium-sized urban fire department is basically running a corporation. As I said, Hunter built a total of seven fire miles. They range from uh, 060, 061, 085, 093, 092, and 0109 and 116. As the fair mill uh, got built through uh, different small uh, boat builders, a group was formed by Alistair Hunter and his son, Don. Now, uh, what I wanna do is talk a little bit about the beginning of logging in the early period. So right after the War of 18, or the Napoleonic Wars, uh, we have the uh, development of logging in this area. Uh, and the logging started uh, right around, uh, the first sawmill was uh, was the cold water mill. Anyway, the cold water mill was uh, started as an economic development project. And one thing we know about people from Ram is they're entrepreneurs to today. They're known as being one of the most entrepreneurial um, uh, bands in Ontario. Thank you.